Emma, come here, sweetie. Here is the moon. Oh! Are you howling at the moon? Uh -huh. What a good little wolfie. So hopefully that sets the mood for this video, which is going to be about astronomy. Over the last month, any time I've had clear skies, I set up one of my telescopes, and this was taken just the other night, clearly, that is Jupiter. What we're going to look at is the exposure value. As you can see, at this exposure value, we can see the bands on the clouds of Jupiter itself, but we cannot see the moons, and we cannot see any of the surrounding stars. To do that, we need to increase the exposure value significantly. There you can see the moons becoming visible. If we increase the exposure further, you can also see the stars. But notice how overexposed Jupiter is at that value. And this addresses one of the flat Earth claims. When we see footage of the moon or the Earth from space, they often claim, why can't we see the stars? And the reason is, using the correct exposure value for the moon or the Earth, it is too low to see the stars. If we wanted to see the stars, the object, Earth or Moon, would be severely overexposed, as you see here. I then move to Saturn. There you can see Saturn. And once again, we see Saturn, but no stars, unless we increase the exposure value significantly. When you have an equatorial mount correctly polar aligned, the angle of the aligned axis is going to match your latitude, no matter where you are on the Earth. I'm presently in Sydney, Australia, which is south 34 degrees latitude in the Southern Hemisphere. And therefore, this angle is also 34 degrees. Now, in the Southern Hemisphere, the up direction is facing the South Celestial Pole, and the down direction is facing the North Celestial Pole. If I was in the Northern Hemisphere, that would be reversed with the up direction facing the North Celestial Pole. What I have done with all my telescopes is orientate the cameras in such a way that the up direction in the capture is up as it would appear at the North Pole. And that means the up position is towards the North Celestial Pole. Now this has a number of advantages. It means every time the horizon crosses the image, it will be oriented correctly with respect to the direction of up at the North Pole. And that means you see a very different angle looking east versus looking west when the sun sets. Additionally, the orientation of the constellations is going to appear the same with any of my telescopes. And if you try this, at any other location on the Earth with a camera oriented to match the direction of the North Celestial Pole, the orientation of any star constellation will appear identical no matter where you are on the Earth. So when we have a sunrise in Sydney, Australia, looking east, you can see the angle of the Earth is matching the angle shown in the telescope as the sun comes up. And after following the sun all day, you can see that when it sets, the angle of the horizon matches what you would expect in Sydney, Australia at south 34 degrees latitude. So this all day time lapse of the sun goes for more than nine minutes and I try to keep my videos as short as possible. So I'll just show you the relevant parts, but I'll post a link to the full video in the description below. There's the sunrise, the all-day time-lapse, and 
the sun set. And you can see the horizon at that angle I mentioned. And I have timestamps on my videos. This is the format, the year, the month, the day, and the time in UTC. What we're looking at here is a small constellation, which is one of my favorites when I want to film the geostationary satellites because of the unique shape of the constellation. And this brightest star goes by the designation of SAO 121170. It's currently visible in the early evening in Sydney, Australia, which is not always the case because the Earth is orbiting around the sun. Certain times of the year, I just can't see it at all. But right now, it is there. And this is an image taken just the other night from a time lapse. To identify the position of this star, we can open a program such as Sky Safari. And if we type in the designator, SAO 121170, and click, it will take us to that position. Now this is set up for Sydney, Australia. So this is what the night sky looks like at the moment. This line represents the meridian, the north direction. This line represents the celestial equator. And these green dots represent the geostationary satellites. As you can see, they are north of the celestial equator. Zooming in on that constellation. We can see the shape. Now remember, the camera in my telescope is oriented to the up direction at the North Pole. And that is why we see the image reversed to how we see it here. But if I just fast forward, you will see that the geostationary satellites move nicely through the middle of that constellation. because I have the camera oriented the way I do, these satellites are going to appear to move from the right to the left. Let's look at that a little further. So in that short time lapse, you saw the satellites clearly moving from right to left. And that is correct when you think about the geometry and how the camera is oriented. The other thing you will notice is that because this is being filmed with an equatorial mount, there will be no rotation of the image. And we could film this constellation all night with that equatorial mount, the image will not rotate and the satellites will move in a straight line from right to left all night. Now here's some geometry that doesn't work on a flat Earth. If we had somebody in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, Simon Dan in the UK, or Bob the Science Guy in the USA, and they had their telescopes pointed at this same constellation with the camera oriented in the direction of up at the North Pole, they would see this constellation in the same orientation as you see it here. And again, using an equatorial mount, there would be no rotation of the image as it was filmed through the night. What they would not see, however, are these geostationary satellites. In the Northern Hemisphere, the line of geostationary satellites will appear south of the celestial equator. A long distance from this constellation. So here is a small rotating globe and the thing to remember about the geostationary satellites is that they orbit at an altitude of almost 36,000 kilometers 
and that is almost three times the diameter of the Earth itself. So on this scale, the geostationary satellite is going to be roughly this far out from the Earth, and it is moving around its orbit at the same angular rate as the Earth itself. And that is why it remains stationary in the sky when viewed from the Earth. The only place to have a geostationary satellite is directly above the Earth's equator. And what that means is that if you're in the southern hemisphere looking up at the geostationary satellites, they're going to appear north of the celestial equator. If you're in the northern hemisphere, they're going to appear south of the celestial equator. And that is certainly what I see from Sydney, Australia. They are roughly five degrees north of the celestial equator. So when we have a camera on a telescope on an equatorial mound oriented in a way that the camera is referencing the direction of up at the North Pole, when that telescope is not tracking, the camera is moving with the rotation of the Earth. So the star field is going to appear to move from the left to the right in the frame. If the telescope mount is tracking as the Earth is rotating, that camera is remaining in one direction as the Earth rotates. And so the satellites which are orbiting with the Earth are going to appear to move from the right to the left. That is precisely what we see when we do this experiment. So when I play this clip, when the telescope is tracking the stars, you will see the satellites moving from right to left. When I stop the tracking, which means the telescope is stationary, you will see the star field moving from left to right, and the satellites will appear stationary. There they are, moving from right to left. I stop the telescope, and notice this little fella. We'll talk about him a bit more shortly. But what we have here are Himawari 8 and 9, plus a few more satellites. You can see they are stationary as the star field is moving past. And that is because the tracking on the telescope has been turned off. So we're back in Sky Safari Pro now and looking at the position of Himawari 8 as seen from Sydney, Australia. You can see it is north of the celestial equator and west of the meridian. If we zoom in, we can see Himawari 9 also and those three other stationary satellites that we saw in the time lapse. There's Himawari 9. And here is the one that we saw moving. Now, this is one of the Chinese GPS satellites in the Beidou constellation. If we fast forward, you'll see it is moving and oscillating back and forth. And there is another one, which is also one of the Beidou satellites, moving back and forth. So they're not quite geostationary. And the reason they're doing this is because the alignment of their orbit is not perfect in relation to the equator. It is only very slightly off, but that's enough to cause this oscillation back and forth. And occasionally you get other satellites moving through this group. As you can see, those two satellites are just going back and forth. Now they've disappeared because the program is telling us that they would no longer be visible. That is probably because it's daylight. Let's have a look at the actual time lapse. So this one was taken a few nights ago and here is Himawari 8. This is 9, this is the Beidou satellite that is moving, and these are the other three that are stationary. You'll see as the time lapse continues, this one moves down, and the second Beidou satellite moves up through the frame.
And while watching that, you might have noticed this little satellite which just moved through and appeared to be flashing. Now, when a satellite flashes like that, it probably means that it is no longer in service and it is just tumbling out of control. And that is why it appears to flash. You see quite a lot of those during long duration time lapse videos. Now I have a lot more footage, but I like to keep my videos under 20 minutes. I'll just show you this one briefly. This was with the Coronado Solar Telescope, the Hydrogen Alpha Telescope. And during this time lapse, we could see a small prominence here. What I was able to do with the time lapse software is just enhance the image by adjusting the tone curve. And that makes the prominence more clearly visible. So as we fast forward the time lapse, which is covering several hours of real time, you can very clearly see how it moves. And there's the sunset. Flat earthers often claim that we don't know what the sun is, but any time that I've personally imaged it with my solar telescope, I see exactly the same thing that NASA tells me. I should be seeing. On the day that I saw that prominence, NASA was showing the same thing. So I've got the solar telescope out again, and this is the current image from NASA of the sun. And looking at my own results, we can see that same filament. And this is the final time-lapse clip I'd like to show in this video. It is Jupiter and its moons taken last night over several hours. When you fast forward the time-lapse, you can clearly see these two moons, which are Io and Europa, changing position. And also the group, the planet Jupiter, plus its moons are moving with respect to the star field behind. If you notice this moon with respect to this star, the motion is quite apparent. So the group is moving with respect to the star field and the moons are moving with respect to each other. Just as the heliocentric model predicts. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. It's now time for me to go to bed, so I'll slip into my cozy NASA pajamas. What a great company to work for.